Thank you, Ben. As always, wonderful, wonderful worship service. Well, I mentioned we had a new member last week. We've got a new member this week. And that is, hey, wait a minute, Jordan, before you go, get there to the back. Jordan Daniel Wood has joined our church this morning. I have his. I have his, and he's got his wife. That's Amanda, right? Okay, hi, Amanda. We're glad to have y'all. Of course, your family you got a bunch of kids. I I can remember Zacchaeus' name real easy. We may use that this morning. Okay, your permission. Didn't want to set that thing down there unless everything was off. We might have another. Uh, Squealing attack. Well, have you ever noticed how efficient, proficient, and good we are at telling other people what they should do? Isn't that true? Isn't that something that seems to just come natural to us? You know, we always see the flaws, you know, the coal <laughs> in other people's lives. But what about our own lives? By in the Bible, there was uh, an occasion where Jesus was sitting down to eat with uh, what was considered by the social upper class of the day to be sinners to be no accounts, someone to shun, someone to, to not have anything at all to do with them. Jesus was sitting down to dinner with some of those people and, and the Pharisees came up to Jesus' uh, disciples. They didn't approach Jesus, they came up to the disciples they said, hey, uh, why, does your, why does your master sit down to eat with publicans and sinners. Now, you may not know what a publican is or was. A publican was a tax collector. <laughs> Isn't it kind of funny how they equate sin and tax collectors together there? Kind of like we do today, isn't it? You know? I tell you what, I'm glad I'm not an IRS agent because, uh, or an IRS employee because they're some of the most hated people in America today. Well, we won't go into that any farther. But the fact is, they equated publicans as just being automatically deemed sinners. And they said, why does Jesus sit down with them? And then other times he was ridiculed for, again, for being sociable and being nice and, and talking to because, you know, we're not going to talk to those people. You know, unless, unless you're up here in our strata, the Pharisees said, unless you're up here and good like us, we're not going to have anything to do with you. Well, it really got to them one day, I guess, whenever Jesus was going through this town, you remember, and there was this tax collector, this publican, and his name was Zacchaeus. <laughs> that's where I got that. And I'm sure that's who Zacchaeus, little Zacchaeus, was named after. And you remember that little vacation Bible school song? I sung it many times. You know, I used to be a youth minister, a youth pastor, and so vacation Bible school was kind of my realm back in the early days of my ministry. And, and, Sing that little song, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. He climbed up, y'all know it, climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And when the Savior came that way, he looked up in that tree. And you know, he said, he didn't say, Zacchaeus, you know, sorry, no good for nothing, sinner. I got something to tell you. No. What did he do? He said, come down, Zacchaeus, I'm going to eat in your house today. You know, in their culture, in their society, the greatest honor you could pay anyone 
was to go to their house and eat with them. That was a high honor. Nowadays we say, oh, so and so's coming over here to eat. What are we going to fix? What are we going to make? Ah, uh, dread. But in Jesus' day, that was an honor. Jesus was paying Zacchaeus an honor. Now, I want to ask you something. What would you think had been Zacchaeus' reaction if Jesus had gone over there and called him a low, get down, no good sinner? Come down out of that tree, I'm going to tell you, give you what for. I'm going to tell you what it's like. That might have made the might have made you or me feel a lot better. And usually, you know, as I've always said, the reason why we feel better at running down other people is because it makes us feel better about ourselves. Basically what we're saying, I'm glad, just like the Pharisees again said in one of Jesus' stories, well, I'm glad I'm not like other men are. God, I'm glad I'm not a sinner like this tax collector. What tax collectors really call it in Jesus' day? Why? Well, I, 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 I tithe and I fast and I do all kinds of things for you. I'm just glad I'm not like that. That's the reason why I'm running other people down. Makes us feel better for a little while because it kind of takes uh, the attention off of our own stuff. You know, we all have stuff, don't we? Amen. The Bible said, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every last one of us has sinned. And anything we can do to get the attention off of us for a little while is always uh, pleasant for us for a period of time. Getting attention away from us kind of minimizes our sin to in our way of thinking, doesn't it? You know, whenever I was a little boy, <laughs> even up to a young man, my daddy's parents did not have an indoor bathroom. There was one water tap in the house, cold water tap, that was in the kitchen. If you wanted hot water, you put it in a pot and boil it on the stove. They had butane stove, not propane, butane. Some of y'all old enough to remember butane. But there was an outhouse. Some of you probably can remember outhouses. Some of you may have experienced an outhouse. My grandparents had an outhouse. It was a one-holer. Okay? I remember going out the back, you know. They didn't, they, they didn't have a door. You know, you seen those little wood doors that have the half moon or quarter moon on you know. They didn't have that. They had a feed sack. <laughs> and I was always kind of funny. You sit down there and you get ready to do your stuff. A feed sack was worn out and worn off, and it kind of went like this, you know, down. I mean, you you, you did anybody passing by could see right straight in, but but nobody passed by. I mean, this was in the middle of the country. There wasn't anybody else around for half a mile, so nobody could see it. With all the pine trees and hardwood trees that were around it, you couldn't have seen if you were right next door, you know, so to speak. But you know what? That, that stuff in there stunk, didn't it? I remember my granddaddy put lime on it and, and every once in a while he'd go clean it out and bury it somewhere, you know, but it stunk. Don't you like thinking about this right before lunch? Well, that's the way we are about our sin. We're walking around acting like our outhouse doesn't stink. But it does. Yeah, it is kind of funny, isn't it? Ridiculously funny. So we're so quick to criticize others and tell them what they need to do. What about us? Think about it. And one of the biggest problems that churches have is those of us in the church we get that kind of attitude and we start going around and we start telling other people in the church what they need to do and how they ought to do it and how they're not flying right and how they're not doing right. You listening? Everybody listening? Huh? Yeah. Thinking, thinking about this now? 
Think about it. I've had more people as a pastor in the last, last many years come to me and say, I, mean, I just haven't liked churches. Why don't you like churches? Well, I'm just not, I just don't feel well in there. I just don't feel like I fit in. I feel kind of dirty. At least that's the way I'm made to feel. You know how that happens. Someone new comes in, sits down, and there's a, there's a judgment crew there going, looking you over. Either you come in, you sit down, and it's, it, it's, it's, it's like you are the outhouse. Nobody wants to have, have anything to do with you. Nobody comes up and speaks to you. Nobody comes up and welcomes you. Nobody comes up and it does anything. And whenever you try to do something for the Lord, if you get involved, you try to do something, there's always somebody there, it seems like, who's there, their job is to tell you how you ought to do it. Because, you know, they know everything. They know it all. Well, let me read a passage of Scripture to you. Matthew chapter 7, you'll also find parallel Scripture in Luke chapter 6. But Matthew 7 says this, and if you have a red letter edition of the Bible, you will see this is red letter. And the reason it is is because these are the words of Jesus himself. Jesus says, do not judge. Or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now that right there should be enough to tell us stay away from being judgmental. Stay away from judging other people. Now that doesn't mean that they're off the hook. You know, God did not, but God did not make you to be their judge. God is their judge. God is the only one who's righteous and holy and has the right to be their judge. I'm not minimalizing what other people do, the sin in their life. There we go again. Better stand still. That's what they taught me in preacher school. Stand still and hold on to the book. I never was any good at following instructions. But the thing is this, you know, we we're not realizing enough the, the sin that's in our own life and that we need to straighten out our own lives and work on ourselves before we take it upon ourselves to straighten everybody else out. Jesus said in verse 3, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? I have a lot of experience with sawdust. I've been in the building business all my life. I remember whenever I was a teen, young teenager, about 1964, 1965, I went to work after school and on Saturdays for my uncle. He owned a lumber yard in East Texas, Palestine, in East Texas. And, you know, besides East Texas being 50 years behind every place else, even back then, there was no such thing, at least we didn't know anything about what they called dust collection systems or OSHA. There wasn't any such thing as OSHA. So one of my jobs at the lumber yard was there was always seemingly a pile of sawdust back in our shop. We used to make cabinets back there. We used to make door units back there. We used to do all kinds of woodworking back there. And right under the table saw and around the table saw there was all this, always this pile of sawdust. Behind the radial arm saw. There was always a pile of sawdust. Uh, there was a joiner back there. You may not know what a joiner is, but it kind of kind of like a plane. And, and there was always wood chips. And you know what? I was low man on the totem pole, so you guess who got to shovel all that stuff? It was me. At least I wasn't shoveling the outhouse. That's the thing I'm very thankful for. But the sawdust. Let me tell you what. You get a little piece of little piece of sawdust in your eye, and it hurts. It hurts. 
So I've had plenty of experience with that. But Jesus said, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank or it can also be translated beam in your own eye. And I brought this today. I thought this was pretty good. Pretty good illustration. <laughs> Now, a beam in Jesus' day was something like this, except it was a lot longer because it was something that was used to support a roof or support a structure. Now, Jesus is saying, first, take the beam out of your own eye before you try to take the speck of sawdust out of your brother's eye. So, yeah, object lesson here, isn't it? If I had to brought this, you'd say, beam, well, you know, a little stick. No, it wasn't a little stick. And this is the comparison that Jesus was making. You know, how, how can I see if I got this in my eye? Not very well. I'm going to put it down because this sucker's getting heavy. Yeah, you're worried I'm going to drop it on you, right? <laughs> I almost got a splinter in my finger, much less my eye. But, you see, you kind of see what Jesus was talking about? We need to get rid of the stinking stuff, the stinking sin in our own life before we try to take the stuff out of somebody else's eye. I prayed for years and years, you know, as a minister, people come to me for counseling. And they want me to tell them what to do. What do I need to do? For years and years I prayed, God, help me not to judge. You know, it's difficult, it's hard to live in this sinful world for Jesus Christ. I don't do that great a job myself. God just help me to be a help, not a hindrance. Help me to help people, not criticize and judge them. Because that could be me. For the grace of God, I can have that same problem. Reed and I have been having some real fun times lately. We've had problems. Not between each other. Don't think that. No. We, fortunately, we haven't had any problems between each other. But a pass by a friend's house up here a while ago and on the way to church after the fight to get the kids ready and in the car and the truck and down here and I passed by and I said to Rita, I said, honey, at least, you know, we have each other because my friend whose house we passed had lost his wife a few months ago. You can always look around and see somebody in worse shape. But my stuff, Danny Shaver's stuff, is a beam in my eye. And unless I'm willing to address my stuff and take care of my stuff, are you listening? How can if I if I can't if I don't address my stuff, what right do I have to tell you what you need to do with your stuff? I haven't got a right in the world. And you know what? You don't either. You know, I've never seen a human being, I never have seen a human being that, I was talking to a brother back there a while ago, it's kind of like a teenager. He said whenever he was a teenager, he knew everything. I think that's something that's common for all of us. The problem is, some of us are 65 years old and we still think we know everything. At least when it comes to somebody else's life. We need to discover what Jesus did. You remember whenever he was standing under that tree talking to Zacchaeus? And he told Zacchaeus, come on down Zacchaeus because I am going to eat at your house today. 
And Zacchaeus came down. And, and we're not told the exact conversation over dinner that, that Zacchaeus and Jesus had. But I do believe, and I don't believe I'm wrong, that at the end of the dinner, Zacchaeus made a promise. He said, I'm going to give half of everything I've got to the poor, and if I have cheated any person, I'm going to pay them back for them. Now something happened between the tree and the end of dinner Amen. that changed Zacchaeus. And I can guarantee you it wasn't Jesus reading Zacchaeus the riot act over dinner. I have discovered, I have found, by loving people, you get much better results than you do by criticizing people. And that's something each and every one of us need to learn and realize. We need to look into the mirror and tell ourselves every day that fact that but for the grace of God go I. I first heard that statement in reference to Dwight L. Moody and a friend. I've told you this before. But it's something that has stuck in my mind and stuck in my heart. And that is Dwight L. Moody was walking with a friend through Chicago one night. And they saw this old drunk and he was stumbling around and he was, you know, looking for something to help him make it down the street. And he was going down an alley and he was just going from building to building in that alley. And instead of uh, Dwight L. Moody saying, you know, I know, sorry, wretched so-and-so, what did he say? He said to his friend, he said, there but for the grace of God go I. I am and you are blessed by the grace of God. And just as Jesus got a lot more from loving people and caring for people, got more of them to come around to God's way of thinking, we get a lot more from folks if we love them and accept them and try to be a help to them. And it does not involve <coughs> criticism and hate. It does not involve us trying to build ourselves up before God and before man by running our brother or sister down. Because that's exactly what we're doing when we do that. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank, a beam in your own eye? You hypocrite. That's pretty strong language. Jesus used it. You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the back from your brother's eye. The Bible says, and I hope I can quote this, or at least you can get the idea. It says, those of you who would correct a brother, consider yourself first. Unless you find yourself in the same sin as they. You know something I found in preaching? God gives me something to preach about and talk about. A lot of times, it's right close to a period of time where I did the same thing I'm preaching about. Or went through the same thing I'm preaching. And I think God allows that to keep me from getting up here and being a self-righteous preacher 
and telling everybody what they ought to do. I'm in the same boat. Let's work to get the beam out of our own eye. And then let's work with each other and love each other to help each other to become the children of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you for the day. I thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for your word. Heavenly Father, I just pray that Circle J Cowboy Church, the people, Circle J Cowboy Church, because the people are the church, help us to be an accepting church, a loving church. Help us to deal with our own stuff. Help us to become more and more a child of God. Heavenly Father, if there's anyone here today that has trouble, and I know there are, just Lord, just help us all to bring it to the throne of grace and leave it there. Your word has said that if we confess our sins, that you are able and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Heavenly Father, we recognize you are the only one that can do this. We cannot go to anyone else for forgiveness. So if there's unconfessed sin in our lives, if we've been guilty of judging others, if we've been guilty, Heavenly Father, of sticking our nose into other people's business and telling them what they ought to do and just giving them what for, help us, dear Heavenly Father, to repent of that and to pray for them and to encourage them and try to help them instead of trying to judge them and bring them down. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for coming. We've got a baptism. We're going to have it right out front here in the, in the trough that we use for a baptistry. So don't run off, but if you would, get out there in about five minutes or so, okay? Thank you.